so this paper is um, a sequel to uh, a paper I wrote, wrote last year uh, about fintech, and this paper is basically. Sorry, the, um, did you have any slides or? Um... No. Ah, okay. Sorry. Okay. No. Um, I thought it would be easier without slides, um, but in any event. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's the question that uh, I kind of um, keep hearing people ask at various fintech conferences uh, is basically, well, what, what are we trying to regulate when we regulate fintech? Are we trying to regulate uh, technology as it is applied to finance or are we trying to regulate finance as it's enabled by new technology? And of course, everybody's answer is immediately, of course, we're gonna try to regulate finance as uh, applied, uh, as enabled by technology. Technology is always secondary and the regulatory agencies in particular always emphasize that they are technology agnostic. But in reality, of course, uh, most of the policy discourse and the real actions uh, out there uh, follow somewhat different paths because uh, in reality, they're trying to incorporate and absorb specific technologies into the existing regulatory framework. And of course, that's an important process, but if this is truly a disruptive moment in uh, the financial world and in the regulatory world, then this is also an important opportunity to reconsider and revisit and reassess the existing model of financial regulation in general. So my interest is kind of going above more specific and granular discussions about this particular technology or that particular area of financial markets affected by it and look at the relationship between law, finance and technology and see you know, whether or not we're trying right now to focus too much on the type of technology that's kind of driving the process instead of perhaps going a little bit broader and deeper and looking at the kind of finance we are uh, uh, witnessing develop and the kind of law we may uh, need to think about. So um, the, the current paradigm of financial regulation, I call it a technocratic paradigm. Of course, it's sort of, it's a concept that can be filled with different meanings. The way I see it, it's sort of the, the model of financial regulation that is built on uh, the fundamental concept of structural compartmentalization uh, along product and entity lines. And it's not just the US model of actually having administrative silos even in those uh, jurisdictions where there is a single regulator, nevertheless, the substance and the nature of oversight of securities markets, for example, versus banking markets, versus insurance markets, differs based on the assumptions of what those products uh, do and how they're packaged and how they're documented, how they operate. Um, there is uh, also a very fundamental assumption of this narrow, technically precise targeting of um, specific, clearly identified and isolated phenomena and risks in specific markets. And so the regulators are trying to use technical tools to address those specific market failures and avoid making uh, overtly normative judgments uh, or uh, use uh, overtly structural tools that exceed or um, cross over various jurisdictional uh, structurally compartmentalized boundaries. Um, and generally speaking, um, the, the sort of the, the focus of uh, the current model of financial regulation is primarily microtransactional uh, rather than the sort of ma macrostructural systemic um, uh, kind. Um, and, uh, you know, that implicates a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, specific issues and specific approaches in various pockets of fi financial markets and regulations. So technology uh, has been for a while pushing this regulatory model to its limits. And that started, of course, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s with the deriv derivatives development and um, you know, structured, uh, structured finance in general. But FinTech in this last decade uh, has taken that challenge uh, to the very uh, kind of paradigm of what financial regulation is to the next level. And it's done so by transforming the very object of the regulation in other words, the financial system itself in a variety of systemic ways. So in the paper, I try to kind of create a, a, a brief taxonomy of those ways. Uh, and of course, it's not clear demarcation because those categories bleed into one another. Um, and so I call them the scale and scope, speed, velocity, trust and power, transparency and governance and bird boundaries. So um, just very briefly, scale and scope, um, the new technology is making finance bigger. It's opening the market to new entrants that didn't used to be part of it. All these FinTech companies, big and small, uh, 
which is, of course, uh, the prompt for this conference uh, in general. And those companies are bringing in new products, um, some of them truly novel, some of them not so new, nevertheless. And they're opening the financial services markets to uh, potentially new types of client, new types of uh, consumer. Uh, the speed and velocity, that's sort of a self-explanatory uh, change. The entire raison d'etre of uh, a lot of technologies in this day and age is making transactions faster so that people can wire money to one another, make payments, make decisions, and so on and so forth, pretty much without any time delay. Uh, and that is uh, affecting not just individual transacting, but it's affecting the dynamics of the market as a whole. Uh, the technocentricity, uh, the trust and power thing. So um, technology has been moving into the center of how finance operates again for decades, but something is qualitatively different this time. The computer programs algorithms are truly at the center of decision making in a very new way. And uh, of course, the, a lot of the techno enthusiasts uh, these days are uh, using that as kind of an advantage to say, look, we're moving the, the power away from this corrupt banks, incumbent financial institutions that have proven themselves to be greedy and um, unattentive to real people's needs into the hands of objective, scientifically determined and transparent, therefore, uh, uh, algorithms. But of course, in reality, that's not true because those algorithms and programs are created by human beings more most importantly for other human beings that may still be uh, greedy untrustworthy and so on and so forth except now this sort of the the veneer of technical scientific objectivity might be hiding those uh, fundamentally human power relationships um, transparency and governance uh, again because of in part because of this sort of difficulty of understanding algorithms uh, and uh, decision making dynamics it's uh, it's um, you know it's making finance more opaque it makes it more complex and more importantly more unpredictable to uh, the financial market participants especially those who are not at the very center of uh, those uh, very technically driven decisions and blurred boundaries that sort of uh, the blurred boundaries uh, between markets and between jurisdictions uh, the sort of, um, you know, traditional kind of jurisdictional boundaries have been eroding again for decades with the globalization of financial markets. But this time around, it's sort of, again, taking uh, the whole trend to a new level because in some sense, the virtu virtualization of uh, financial markets is making the very concept of uh, kind of geographic boundaries or even product boundaries uh, kind of outdated and less uh, practically manageable than that. So um, on the micro transactional level, right, from the point of view of transacting counterparties in financial markets, be it investors, lenders and creditors, payers and payees, these changes in general uh, appear overall positive because everybody likes uh, to be able to, you know, transact uh, without uh, unnecessary frictions and more efficiently and so on and so forth. And there is, of course, uh, all this um, sort of uh, expectation and uh, reality of uh, potentially opening uh, financial services markets to a uh, greater swaths of previously unserved population, all of this financial inclusion benefits and so on and so forth. However, uh, you know, if you look at the effect of these changes on the macro systemic level uh, as a sort of a regulatory matter, then the, the picture becomes a lot more complicated. And again, in the paper, I try to go uh, through uh, how each of these changes in, um, in the financial market, each of these five changes um, kind of affects the challenges or opposes uh, specific new challenges to the existing model of financial regulation. So first, the scale and scope challenge. Um, most obviously, the regulatory perimeter expands for all of the regulators out there, no matter how they're structured, no matter what their administrative powers are. Now the diversity and the size of the markets that they have to oversee uh, has grown exponentially. It's very hard to kind of figure out uh, how to control the entry into these markets that used to be tightly controlled in terms of the entry. There are no barriers anymore between finance and commerce, different kinds of finance and so on and so forth. Where is uh, technology uh, ending and uh, finance beginning? It's very hard to tell. 
if any particular product is you know, a technology product or financial product also very difficult to disentangle. Uh, and in that situation, it becomes incredibly hard just as a matter of principle to maintain this compartmentalized, isolated regulatory targeting of various phenomena because the phenomena themselves are much more fluid than they used to be. The speed velocity challenge is particularly interesting to me because, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, it, it's sort of uh, commonplace to tout this sort of frictionless um, uh, transacting as a, a matter of efficiency, increased efficiency, right, and decreased cost. Uh, which leads, of course, to greater financial inclusion, and perhaps it does. But, uh, you know, a simple matter of fact is that frictionless trading uh, also means frictionless speculation. Frictionless speculation changes the dynamics of the market. And in the paper, I go through this sort of um, a concept of how technology is compressing time for decision-making for everybody, right? And uh, it, what it means is that all of the spirals in the financial markets, downward spirals in particular, becomes infinitely faster as well. And that creates a challenge for the regulators because now the regulatory response to any uh, disruptions in this fast moving market have to be, has to be uh, much faster as well, much more decisive and much more broader in terms of uh, crossing various traditional sectors that have been um, separated uh, beforehand. And that means that um, a lot of the regulatory response cannot wait until the frictions occur or downward, downward spirals begin. A lot of that response has to be preemptive in some, in some ways and anticipatory, which raises a, a, huge, uh, um, a huge range of uh, uh, regulatory capacity issues, of course. Then the third challenge is the trust power challenge, right? Um, so now the regulators need to be able to identify and counteract certain hidden patterns of power distribution and power abuse that didn't used to exist, uh, or maybe were not as important uh, in the pre-fintech era. But more important than that, in order to even understand uh, or appreciate the need to look for this new hidden power patterns in financial markets, um, the regulators need to be aware of this shift, the, the attitudinal shift in the perception of finance from being a, a fundamentally sort of matter of regulation, matter of policy or political economy to understanding finance as a matter of technology. In other words, um, you know, this is a, this is a, a change in uh, the general kind of concept of what the nature of regulatory enterprise is. Uh, and of course, in terms of regulatory capacity, uh, this kind of trust and power challenge uh, increases the pressure on financial regulators to develop in-house te technological expertise. But at the same time, it also makes it much more difficult and much more important for regulatory agencies to maintain a stronger internal normative cohesiveness and focus on their regulatory mission that has nothing to do with uh, technology per se. So if, for example, regulatory agencies now have to hire more uh, computer engineers and software engineers and other technologists, what will it do to the internal dynamics, internal culture uh, that used to be sort of already fraught with this uh, deep conflict conflict uh, among the between the cultures of lawyers and economists? And we don't know that, we don't know how, uh, how ready we are for that. The first challenge is I call a transparency governability challenge that sort of uh, again, self-explanatory, but the one thing that I wanted to emphasize here is that um, the limits of disclosure. Disclosure is such a, a trusted and true and tried uh, sort of tool of regulation that is the first thing we go to when a new problem arises, partly because it's, um, it's sort of, uh, it's um, exposed but can be imposed ex ante, and it's also politically normatively kind of the least controversial because after all, you can justify better disclosure by reference to market efficiency alone, not just other sort of more nebulous, softer notions like fairness or you know, stability or whatnot. Uh, and in this world of fast moving uh, algorithm driven um, finance, to what extent disclosure really matters, especially with the tightly compressed decision making times and uh, sort of uh, fast moving spirals in financial markets, that's a big question and requires a huge shift in our thinking. 
structural problems. There is more layering and more pooling of tradable assets. And in um, in my you know previous article on uh, fintech as a, a systemic phenomenon, I sort of developed this concepts of uh, meta transaction technologies and financial markets, right? Innovation technologies that uh, are being used right now in the area of fintech. In you know in that in that mode to kind of uh, uh, create new tradable, um, synthesize and create new tradable asset categories through layering and pooling. And what that does, it, it complicates sort of the task of the regulators of seeing through all these multiple layers of these uh, digitally created tradable assets to understand all of this sort of vertical and horizontal connections in uh, financial markets. And that creates a new challenge for financial regulators in terms of targeting not just specific types of transaction uh, in this isolated manner to which they used, um, but to perhaps refocus their attention on targeting new structural nodes of power in these markets, new market super infrastructures, whatever they are, these digital platforms and the types of functions they perform, some of them traditional financial intermediary functions, some of them new functions um, in order to kind of uh, get a hold of, uh, of the uh, core kind of defining links in, in, um, in the dynamics of the new financial markets. The fifth uh, challenge, the last challenge is the boundary challenge. Here, uh, one of the fundamental conceptual difficulties is that in this um, a kind of traditional technocratic paradigm of financial regulation, uh, we operate on the basis of this assumption that financial products and services can be sort of defined based on the combination, some combination of their form uh, and uh, the economic substance. So a security instrument is under the Howey test, it's an investment contract or it's this or it's that. A banking product uh, has a particular set of attributes and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the tokens, for example, digital assets are by definition pure form and they're pure kind of empty containers that carry information in, uh, in a particular code, um, you know, language, universally readable language. And a formal categorization of financial products that take that form of the tokenized form uh, becomes much more difficult if we assume some kind of specific economic substance into them in order to place them in a particular regulatory box, be it a security, be it a, a banking product or so on and so forth. And sort of uh, that conceptual um, uh, challenge is very difficult to meet. And of course, the entry of the big tech, uh, big tech firms into uh, financial markets presents a particular structural boundary challenge because uh, it raises a lot of politically salient questions. And it also uh, makes it uh, much more important and also difficult for financial regulation suddenly, uh, for financial regulators suddenly to track developments outside finance and track developments in um, the world of those big tech firms which is a very diverse world. Is it, in, is it uh, e-commerce? Is it social media platforms? Uh, is it provision of um, internet search engines? What is it? It's very difficult. And of course, it, uh, all of these boundary challenges increase the importance of international cooperation, interagency cooperation, but also makes that cooperation much more difficult. So, of course, these regulatory challenges are not unique to fintech, but uh, fintech elevates them to a new qualitative level. And this borderless and frictionless finance now demands um, an equally borderless and flexible regulation. And in, in the paper, I go through the current regulatory approaches uh, to regulation. And basically, um, my um, assessment of these uh, regulatory responses is that they primarily still aim at absorbing the newcomers and new uh, technologies on a technology by technology basis into the existing regulatory framework, uh, be it through chartering or through experimentation and seeing or should it uh, have some kind of a new, um, uh, you know, regulatory regime or is it okay or so on and so forth. So this accommodative approach is still kind of proceeding on an assumption that the general uh, philosophy of financial regulation still stands. And um, it uh, therefore remains fundamentally fragmented and fundamentally accepts uh, technology as a, as a uh, uh, sort of a response to challenges posed by technology. Um, 
I think that is missing the point of a new regulatory paradigm. In my view, the new uh, uh, regulatory paradigm should be post-technocratic. Uh, if you want um, to call it that way. There has to be more open-ended regulatory authority, more flexible tools, but the tailoring of the tools cannot be simply done to the new technology or new product type. The tailoring has to be done to the specific regulatory challenge uh, or policy challenge uh, that I've identified earlier. And what does that mean? It means that uh, the new regulatory framework has to be much more explicitly normative rather than technology driven. In other words, the more technological the finance becomes, the more granular technology becomes, the more tailored technology becomes on the microtransactional level, the more important it is for the regulation to become normative on a higher kind of policy level. Uh, it has to be more explicitly proactive more participatory. The, regula the regulators cannot just act by uh, making rules and supervising uh, their uh, enforcement. They have to actually participate directly in the markets in order to be able to respond to market movements. And that also means that uh, regulation has to become much more exp explicitly structural uh, and the structural tools of uh, responding to uh, fintech changes should be um, should be uh, you know taking a much greater prominence uh, than they do now. That's it. Thank you. I would appreciate any and all comments you may have. Thank you so much, Solo. This was excellent and really uh, to the point. So I ask Luca now to take the floor and to give the discussion. Okay, so my uh, discussion of uh, Saul's excellent paper is made more difficult by the quality of the paper, which means that I will not have that many comments. Uh, and I, I will uh, quickly summarize the paper with two minor comments in, in the process. I will make two points about the technology in FinTech. And uh, uh, finally, I will make one comment about how there are actually three regulatory models to deal with um, fintech, uh, and I will do that using a uh, distracting, uh, distracting anal analogy. So the paper uh, can be very quick in summarizing it because the presentation was very clear. The, the core idea is that fintech uh, is bringing a qualitative change in uh, finance uh, through the quantitative change that it is bringing to it. So Sole is very clear that uh, the trends that she identifies are not new trends, but the, 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 their intensity is so strong that uh, actually uh, we should uh, uh, take uh, this new development as a additional justification for the new financial deal, which is uh, the, the, the paper that, uh, from before the, the, the one to which th this is a sequel um, of, uh, with the uh, Hockett uh, uh, on the new financial deal. Uh, the new paper still deals, I think, on, on that uh, paper and ar argues that with FinTech, it's even more important to have a new financial deal. So my, my small comment here is that because the claim is so core to the paper, perhaps uh, additional empirical evidence on the quantitative change or how significant the quantitative change would make the paper stronger. Then, uh, so uh, I, I will not need to go through all these uh, um, challenges that, uh, uh, um, that Sole has already identified, so I can skip this part of the slide and, and move on to, to uh, notice how Sole criticizes the current uh, approach to fintech, which is uh, more or less facilitate and adapt. It's called uh, by some, including Dirk Tetsch, smart regulation, and uh, Sole argues that this is an, an inadequate technocratic response. Um, which may uh, actually be uh, problematic. And uh, she also uh, notices how the, the, one of the main challenges is uh, uh, to deal with, especially 
the US fragmented the regulatory architecture uh, for financial regulation. And I will only add to the points that she makes that are of course very convincing that uh, if uh, change not only intensifies but uh, accelerates, then a system which is artificially segmented uh, into non-functional lines will become uh, even more dysfunctional um, rather than disruptive uh, because uh, there will be more room for turf wars and boundary disputes uh, going forward that is uh, on, on who should regulate new phenomena and so on which will make the, the system again uh, even less suited than it is now the the recipe you you have uh, seen uh, i mean the, the the solid perhaps didn't go into the details but i don't need to do it either so my, my uh, next comments about are about uh, technologies and in reading the paper i had the impression that this is somewhat of a pre post paper in the sense that it it is written as though the the crypto uh, bubble what we now know was a crypto bubble had not uh, burst in the meantime. So here is an example from, from I found on the internet on, on uh, uh, ICOs, uh, uh, initial coin offerings. It was all the rage uh, two years ago. And um, now it is practically a, a dying uh, phenomenon. Uh, distributed ledger technologies. There was a moment when all big banks were uh, experimenting with uh, them, a, a recent, a relatively recent article from the Financial Times uh, in, in informs us that, uh, well, banks are not so enthusiastic uh, anymore. They basically haven't found a use case for these uh, technologies. And, and so here, my, my, um, my point uh, would be that uh, in, in the paper, uh, Sole puts a lot of emphasis on distributed ledger technologies as pro uh, promising to do many things to the financial system that will be revolutionary and, and dangerous and, and uh, increasing uh, systemic risk and so on. I would, uh, I, I would say that the, 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 the statement may, may still be true if, if you talk about uh, uh, technology, new technologies to core rather than focusing on the DLT. Uh, uh, one final point, stable coins uh, are uh, one of the features that uh, she, uh, that Sole focuses on. Uh, here is, um, are some data I found online which show you that this is a, quite a, 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 a niche uh, a phenomenon, very small. The, the basically led by Tether, which has a market capitalization of only 6.34 billion. For now, it's no big deal. Maybe it will become so. Uh, uh, we can um, have different views on this, but I would be cautious in, in, in uh, making a, a, a big fuss about it at the time. And finally, uh, the second point on technology is that on the other hand, Sole doesn't play the opacity card fully in the current version of the paper. I think she could do more with the opacity that is inherent to machine learning, and this would uh, strengthen her, uh, her uh, claim that uh, uh, change is is, is leading to qualitative uh, differences. And here's a an example of, from the New York Times of how uh, these algorithms are uh, opaque also to those who create them. Uh, Goldman Sachs didn't have a clue of why its algorithm led to discrimination against women when, when it launched the Apple uh, card. So now I would like to focus uh, on uh, something else, which is uh, the, the alternatives that we have. And in the paper, the alternatives are between the smart regulation model and, uh, and the new financial deal model. I, I would like to argue that there are three of these alternatives uh, and I will use as I anticipated uh, 
an analogy that may be distracting. Uh, so first strategy we can call the mitigation model, which is a market friendly uh, model or technocratic, we can call it smart regulation, and gives you the illusion of controlling the phenomenon by doing exactly what is needed to, to uh, contain the risk, but at the same time to foster innovation uh, and increase financial inclusion. And, and the, the, the parts in bold uh, uh, here are taken from the paper. And, and if it sounds uh, familiar with what's going on in the, out, in, in the, uh, the real world at the moment, well, it, it, it's interesting, I would say. Um, then you have the suppression model, which is not uh, considered in the paper. I, I don't think that it would be fair to say that uh, Soler's uh, um, model is uh, similar to a suppression model. This would be the old style, and by old, I mean 1970s, 1980s, maybe model of command and control. and not permitting what is prohibited, you just have to stay home and if you go out, you pay a big fine or you, you, you even go to jail and, and we will deal with uh, a fintech uh, this way. Uh, and we, it's interesting what, that we haven't seen it, I think, anywhere with uh, Bitcoin. Uh, it could have been the case that uh, you could have crashed or, or anyhow limited the impact of Bitcoin significantly by basically keeping out of the main uh, street financial system, e even though, of course, it is a more challenging because Bitcoin is jurisdictionless. But I think uh, uh, regulators around the world could have done a lot to uh, confine the Bitcoin, uh, I want to use the analogy now, um, uh, to, uh, a phenomenon to uh, something practically irrelevant for, for investors. And, uh, and, and we actually have seen uh, uh, this suppression model perhaps of, uh, at, uh, uh, in, in action with uh, Libra. Uh, here you have had uh, uh, multi-unilateral and consistent proactive pushback against an obviously dangerous innovation. Uh, around the, uh, across the world, uh, regulators have just said, uh, stop and, and let us uh, consider all, all the, the aspect and, and, and it has worked for now. So, so th that's very similar to Saul's proposal to have uh, um, a, a, a vetting, uh, an authorization process for new financial products. So maybe there's more into the current system than, uh, uh, than, uh, than uh, we, we are used to think of in terms of uh, being normative and proactive. Uh, and, and I would argue that Saul's model, as I said, is not as tough as uh, this. Um, I should wrap up, I'm told I, I am close to, to, to the end. The, the, what is missing is the testing and tracing model which means wise uh, uh, regulation, as uh, Sole calls it, uh, it it's uh, her, her model and uh, it uh, seems to have worked uh, uh, well uh, in countries which have tried it in the real world against COVID-19. So to sum up, uh, the, the, this, this is the core um, premise of the paper that quantity of change implies qualitative change, I, I would say you may, it would not be nice to see more data. And uh, I wonder whether it's consistent with the deflation of the crypto finance bubble. And um, this qualitative change provides an, an even stronger justification for the proposal for a new deal. And the question here, even, especially after the COVID-19 outbreak and the reaction across the world by uh, central banks is uh, how far exactly are we away from this model uh, as we uh, uh, stand now? So it's a great paper. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss it. Thank you.